Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our webinar dedicated to the plight of Dr. Gubad Ibadoglu. My name is Tomila Lankina. I'm a professor here in the International Relations uh, Department at LSC, and I have known uh, Gubad uh, for some time. He was affiliated with this department for more than two years. Um, and before the, we, I introduce the speakers who have kindly agreed to uh, to speak at this webinar, I wanted to say a few words about Gubad. Um, as, uh, as you may know, this webinar is part of an international campaign to highlight the plight of Gubad and prisoners, political prisoners, and other victims of repression in countries like Azerbaijan and the wider um, region, that part of the world, uh, and to raise attention to specifically the issue of Gubad, who has been imprisoned uh, for over two months now, when he went to visit his family in, in Baku in July of this year. Dr. Gubad Ibadoglu is a well-known academic who has focused on uh, public financial management, good government, good governance, and budget transparency. Uh, he was a Reagan fellow at the National Endowment for Democracy. He has also held appointments with the University of North Carolina at Chapel, Chapel Hill, Duke University, Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton University, Rutgers University, and has been the last two years um, a research scholar at the London School of Economics and Political Science in the International Relations Department. He is the author of many publications, many policy relevant works on corruption, especially in the oil uh, energy sector in Azerbaijan and other petro states. And he is also a political activist who has unsuccessfully tried to register the Azerbaijan democracy and prosperity movement. But also what, what is very important um, to know is that in June of this year, he and several uh, other individuals, collaborators, established an Azerbaijani Youth Education Foundation in the UK. And this foundation was to help bring students from Azerbaijan to study in the United Kingdom and to provide them with scholarships. Now, the, some of this money was to come from funds that had been uh, appropriated or frozen and taken from corrupt uh, Azeri officials, politicians, uh, perhaps the, the first family. And just a few weeks after, just barely two weeks after, he made a public announcement on his Facebook page that he was setting up this foundation. He went to visit his ailing relatives in Baku, and he and his wife, Irada Bayramov, were brutally arrested in a kind of mafia-style way with 20 um, masked men accosted their car, dragged them out of their car. They were taken to a detention center where they were held incommunicado for, for several hours. Uh, they were beaten and, and um, Dr. Gubadi Badoglu still remains in, in prison and has been there for the last more than two months. His wife was released after a few hours of horrific um, um, time and in um, in, in um, detention and um, he is currently not being given the the the, the rights um, and treatment medical treatment that he very very badly needs despite the intervention of various uh, European authorities such as European Court of Human Rights and also the LIC and other institutions have been waging a campaign to try to uh, secure Gubad's release and make sure that he does get the medical uh, treatment uh, whilst in in detention, but to no avail. His health is seriously deteriorating. Um, let me now introduce our speakers who have kindly agreed to uh, give, give, give some comments related to this situation and the broader issue of repression and uh, academic freedoms in the region. 
Professor John Heather Shaw is Professor of International Relations at the University of Exeter. He re his research addresses conflict, security, and development in authoritarian political environments, especially in post-Soviet Central Asia. He's co-author of Doctors, uh, Dictators sorry, Without Borders with Yale University Press and UK's Cliptocracy Problem. He's a principal investigator of an anti corruption evidence project on the transnational ties to democracies of elites from authoritarian states. Um, and he's a member of the Academic Freedom and Internalization, Internationalization Working Group of the UK, which campaigns for transparency and accountability in British universities' international relations. Tom DeWall is a senior fellow with Carnegie Europe, specializing in Eastern Europe and the Caucasus region. He's the author of numerous publications about the region. And I should add, uh, Tom sent us a very modest three line bio, but I should add that his book is uh, always on my syllabus on the Caucasus, uh, very readable and my students love it. We are actually reading it this year in class. So, um, so just a little addition there. And um, Alexandra Morrison is a fellow and tutor in history at New College Oxford, interim director uh, this year of the Oxford Nizami Ganjavi Center for the Study of Azerbaijan, the Caucasus and Central Asia. He was formerly professor of, Hi of history at Nazarbayev University in Astana, Kazakhstan. And he's the author of several books, among them Russian Conquest of Central Asia, with Cambridge University Press and a co-editor of the C Central Asian Revolt of 1916. Um, with that introduction, I open uh, the floor. Uh, each speaker has been asked to speak for about 10 minutes, and we will start with um, Tom. Thank you so much, uh, Tomila. I'm very glad to, to be part of this webinar in support of Gubad um, and to discuss wider developments in the region and to be joined by Alexander Morrison and John Heathershaw. Um, and for me, it's both kind of personal and uh, political um, and scholarly, um, the arrest of Gubad Ibadolu. It's, it's the arrest and detention, unjust detention of a very decent man, but it's also more than that. Um, you know, today I was reading, uh, let me start by saying today I was reading an article on Eurasian Net. It was about um, how the Russian uh, oil company Lukoil is lending one and a half billion dollars to the Azerbaijani state energy company Sokar in order to allow more oil to reach Sokar's refinery in Turkey. I, I read it twice. I was trying to get my head around it. It seemed, it seemed very significant. And almost instinctively, my first reaction was, I really want to see how Gubad analyzes that. And then I stopped myself and thought, actually, I can't do that because Gubad is sitting in jail in, in Baku. Um, Gubad is a kind of first stop, um, and I hope will continue to be when he is released from prison, for those of us who really want to understand the political economy of Azerbaijan within its national and both and its international context. Um, and I've known him for more than a decade. Um, Tommy, I mentioned that he was in Washington when I was there as a Reagan Fiscal Fellow at the National Endowment for Democracy. I think that's when I first knew him. Um, a man of great intelligence. Uh, the words I would use about him are a kind of intelligence, scrutiny, uh, and integrity, but also a man of great humility. He comes from a very humble background, basically a village background, in Fizuli region, which was um, one of the regions uh, occupied and destroyed by uh, Armenian forces uh, in, in the Karabakh conflict of the 1990s. So grew up with very little, um, but rose, uh, as we know, to very eminent scholarly uh, positions. Um, the scrutiny and the integrity you find all over his uh, publications. He's someone who always gives you more. He goes deep into the figures. He's actually read budgets. He's actually done his due diligence on, on all the issues he looks at. And of course, that's what makes him um, really dangerous to a regime like the one in Azerbaijan. He's not just sounding off uh, in a rather general terms. He's actually going into the full detail of what's going on within the political economy of that country. 
um, he was particularly instrumental in uh, Azerbaijan's exit, I would say, from EITI, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. He was on the EITI board, which um, and then Azerbaijan, which is an EITI for those who who don't know it, is was an initiative, is an initiative in which petro states um, are supposed to be transparent about how they spend their revenues um, and, and and their budgets. Um, but clearly, this was not the case with 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 Azerbaijan. Uh, and Azerbaijan left EITI in 2017, thanks to the kind of scrutiny and bravery of several individuals part of EITI who didn't want it just to be a kind of symbolic process. And one of those, of course, was Gubad Ibadolu. Um, one can read Gubad on the significance or less, perhaps less significance than, than announced of the EU gas deal with Azerbaijan. I recommend you read that on the LSE blog one could read his scrutiny of how the money is being spent on the reconstruction of azerbaijan's recovered territories the ones it recovered in 2020 including his own home region of Fuzuli. that's a very another important read so all of this of course makes him uh, made him an uncomfortable figure for the authorities in azerbaijan who are very good at their pr at their messaging in the west uh, about um, the indispensability, the strategic importance of of Azerbaijan, but someone who gives a rather different picture is obviously very uncomfortable, and that's clearly the reason that when he was in Baku this summer, he was arrested because he was too uncomfortable. He was a thorn in the side of the authorities. The brutality of the arrest, as Tomila has said, uh, wasn't accidental. I think there was a demonstration effect there to others like him, that if you stand up to us, this is the way you get treated. Um, he's obviously, his his wife, yeah, Irada, was obviously also maltreated before she was released, but, but Gubad has been kept in very poor conditions. There's no reason why he should not be released into house arrest. But again, there's a demonstration effect also um, denying him medicines that he needs on, on an everyday basis. Um, there's also, I think, a mirroring. Uh, Azerbaijan is one of many countries which likes a kind of mirroring effect when when, when they go after their opponents. Um, he's been accused of fraud and embezzlement, which is obviously a kind of answer to the fact that he himself um, investigates corruption. And um, possibly the most absurd charge, um, I think not made formal yet, was that he's been linked to Islamist Gulenist movements in Turkey. This from a man who I last met for a pint in a London pub, um, the least Gulenist person one can imagine. Um, so it's ominous uh, what's happened to him. It's about him and we seek his release, but it's also about a wider phenomenon. We're seeing um, Last This week marks 20 years since the first inauguration of President Ilham Aliyev in Azerbaijan as president in October 2003. He obviously inherited basically the presidency from his father, but has actually been more autocratic than his father. Um, and um, term limits were abolished. The constitution has been changed um, so that Mr. Aliyev can stay in power pretty much indefinitely. And we're seeing an increased concentrate, concentration of power around him personally and his family. Yesterday, um, we saw him arrive in the city known as both as Stepanakert and Shankendi. As you know, Azerbaijani military operation uh, took that, the province of Karabakh, by force in September. Uh, and the 100,000 Armenians who lived there all fled. Uh, Aliyev was... Um, filmed yesterday making a speech in an empty square, walking around. It was completely by himself. It was, And he also mentioned the fact that this was his kind of 20th anniversary of him becoming president. He looks like he, he intends to stay in power for a long time, that he increasingly thinks l'état c'est moi. And, th and this is really um, quite a disturbing uh, confirmation of a trend that was already in process. Um, so the arrest of Gubad is part of that process. It's something that we should watch more closely, something that those of us who believe in 
human rights and democracy and, and an alternative, more democratic future for Azerbaijan um, should be paying more attention to, should be uh, sticking up to, um, should be holding the government of Azerbaijan to account. I'll, I'll stop there, but I'll be glad to uh, respond to any questions uh, in a bit. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, our next speaker is Professor John Heathershaw. Um, thanks, Tamila. Um, sadly, I did not know Gubad, although I'm familiar with him as a political economist, an anti-corruption specialist, and a, and a scholar under the Scholars at Risk program. I have known other at-risk scholars whose cases are eerily familiar uh, from Central Asia, and this brings back for me quite bad memories of, of those experiences. I think probably, as I'm not an Azerbaijan expert by any means, I think the reason I've been asked to speak is probably for three things that I have been working on. One is money and reputation laundering in Europe by the Aliyev Pashayev elite. And that's a small part of Azerbaijan's story that I have a little bit, and I, I do mean a little bit of expertise on. Secondly, donations to universities as a form of reputation laundering, especially in the UK. And then thirdly, the wider issue of internationalization and academic freedom. And as Tamila mentioned in her introduction, I, I'm part of this parliament supported group in the UK called the Academic Freedom and Internationalization Working Group, which does research and campaigns on these issues. And so I'm going to go through each of those. And, and the first is this Aliyev Pashayev regime, money and reputation laundering. Now, um, as Tom was 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 hinting at and, and knows far more about than I do, uh, the reason I'm using Aliyev Pashayev regime here rather than Azerbaijan is to capture the nature of that regime as I understand it and as appears in our research, that it is broadly speaking a family kleptocracy with broad patron client structures. That means relatives and business associates are an essential part of the regime, even if they don't hold formal positions in that regime. And the political economy works according to principles of favor and privilege. If you're more junior, you're doing favors to the more senior people, in order to receive privileges. Now, using terms like money laundering and reputation laundering, I think present conceptual challenges. Not everyone immediately understands those, but it's important to recognize that when money laundering occurs, that is the cleansing of monies that have illicit origins. When that occurs, it's not about pure secrecy, pure hiding, but it is also about this related idea or related practice rather of reputation laundering. So it's about keeping certain things secret while creating a good public image that actually helps you pass the due diligence tests uh, to, to, to actually launder the money because it's professionals that are involved in that process in banks or in law firms. Now in the UK, we know there is um, a long history of money laundering by the, by the elite, by the Azeri elite. The Azerbaijani laundromat uncovered by Organised Crime and Corruption Reporting Project involved $3 billion being channeled through UK shell companies. Related to that was something called the caviar diplomacy scandal, where European politicians were bribed to improve the image of Azerbaijan in Council of Europe reporting. One of those politicians is now in prison. In London and the UK, we've seen a lot of investment into residential real estate, high value res residential real estate by regime members and family members that is in the region of about $700 million. We've seen a money laundering case, which has been referred to already by Tamila, I think at least indirectly, where the National Crime Agency had recovered around about six million pounds worth of assets linked to a member of the elite, which I think uh, when... Um, when Gubad was beginning to think about the possibility of monies that were recovered being repurposed for a scholarship program, it would probably be that which was first in mind because that's actually recovered money from money laundering and that's quite a rare thing indeed. And we know there's been case involving the daughters of President Aliyev, Azu and Leila, where the checks on them as politically exposed persons weren't done. And actually that's one of the very few cases where you've seen a solicitor who has been found guilty in a tribunal 
of not having done those checks against money laundering. There's also a, a history in Parliament of attempts quite in the open of sort of influencing operations to improve the reputation of Azerbaijan through the all-party parliamentary group and the European Azerbaijan Society paying for the administrator of that group and trips to Azerbaijan. Now, these must be legally declared, but working universities, funding to universities does not need to be legally declared. So if we just move on to that now, we don't know so much about donations to universities in the UK because of the absence of a legal requirement to report those donations. But we know there have been large increases in private donations. Um, we just don't know things like the split between foreign domestic actors and anonymous and named donors even. There have been scandals in the past, not least involving this institution, which hosts us actually the um, the LSE Gaddafi scandal, as it was known from 12 years ago, led to the Wolf Report, which recommended new processes being put in place, which LSE and, and several institutions have done having, for example, an independence gifts committee to assess donations and public ethics criteria. But as I say, there's still no legal requirement to report and close, it disclose donations. So in this environment, how does reputation laundering work? Well, firstly, you can have naming rights for a personal, corporate or national brand. So it's not just about the individual donor, but it could be on behalf of a wider national mission. Secondly, you have networking through being appointed to things like board memberships. And thirdly, you have this international influencing and instrumental uses of a donation because the existence of the donation and that, key, and that link acquires a reputation for the person, which they can then use to advance themselves and defend themselves. There's been a few examples of this. A famous one from 10 years ago was Dmitro Firtash, the Ukrainian, pro-Russian Ukrainian oligarch, giving to Cambridge and then using the fact that he donated there as a rationale for having a reputation to defend in Britain in order to pursue a libel case against the Kiev Post. So a Ukrainian fighting a libel case against the Ukrainian in Britain because of having made, partly due to having made a donation to a university. And I think fourth and finally, there are domestic political payoffs where a donor may increase their reputation among their elites, so within that circle. Now, I don't want to um, preempt anything Alexander might say later regarding the Nizami Ganjavi Center, but, but we know aspects of the first three of those have occurred in that case. We don't know so much about the fourth element because the donor is anonymous, so that makes it harder for us to understand what happened. Um, but that might lead us to further conversations on that later. Third and final point is about the broader issue of internationalization and academic freedom. So both opportunities and threats to academic freedom occur under conditions of internationalization. That's really important to understand. Opportunities include a wider variety of voices like Gubad coming to LSE and the other fellowships that he was a part of and crucially, underrepresented voices from places of study being given these opportunities. But there are threats too. These include scholars from authoritarian states being targeted due to their international work, as we see with Gulbad. Safety and field work. We've seen that with a number of also PhD students from third countries. Uh, Giulio Reggiani, the Italian Cambridge student in, in Egypt. Alexander Siddikov, my colleague in Tajikistan. A third risk, I think, is self-censorship in field work. And we have survey data showing that occurs and that if you work on an authoritarian state, you're more likely to self-censor your field work findings. I think that's a there's sometimes good reasons for doing that. And that's of a different scale of risk uh, to the two I previously mentioned, but it's still worth mentioning. Fourthly, research agendas affected by foreign funding. That's a very sensitive area. There is some anecdotal evidence. I certainly say that that occurs but it's very difficult to pin down. And then fifthly, reputation laundering from the status of an instrumental use of the existence of um, a partnership of some kind. And we, we've talked about that already. So what are the responsibilities that we have when a colleague is arrested in his home country for exercising free speech? What are the responsibilities we have as universities, as academics, as academic 
association. I think immediately that requires host institutions and those with special connections to the country or regime in question to speak out forcefully and clearly. And there are other things of that type that can be done of a campaigning type, uh, scholarly petitions, communications, working with the press to advance that claim. And it's, I know, uh, uh, Tamila and colleagues and many people here, I think, have been involved in that. But there's also a structural need to be involved in what I would call critical engagement. So this is not necessarily boycotting a particular place or blacklisting a particular funder. In extreme circumstances, that might be appropriate, and scholars who are at risk sometimes do call for that. But I think this minimum is that of critical engagement. Um, so I do feel there is a need to place conditions on the way in which we cooperate with state funders and state-linked funders, and that would include the kinds of, um, well, relations that I think Oxford has with um, the Azeri elite through the Nizami Ganjavi Centre. So um, I will stop there at that because that will lead into Alexander's comments. And um, thank you. Thank you very much, John. And uh, as, as you uh, said, it nicely leads us to Alexander's talk, but I just wanted to make a couple of, uh, say a couple of words since you mentioned LIC, and this is why I'm also very interested to, to hear, and maybe some, there will be questions from the audience about the Nizami Ganjavi Center, because whilst there may not be a requirement at the level of law for the um, identity of the donor to be revealed, certainly institutions like LIC have put in place very, very very rigorous since the Qaddafi scan of very robust um, safeguards and certainly scrutinizing where the money comes from, what kind of regimes, precisely for those same those reasons, John, that you mentioned, namely that if there is a large amount of funding coming to the institution, that might compromise academic freedoms if it comes from a dictatorship that is going to kind of um, disincentivize free academic scrutiny of dictatorial repressive regimes. And so I think that is one reason, again, to, to for us all, within university, uh, within British universities to guard against those kinds of precedents of anonymous do uh, donations. So certainly at the level of LIC, I'm very proud of our institution and I have been involved actually with that specific body ethics grants and donations panel. And I'm aware of just how rigorous the scrutiny is. So certainly I, I don't think we would be getting um, those kinds of large multi-million donations without from dictators without scrutinizing and 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 actually advertising um, uh, the or publicizing uh, the sources. So uh, with that, I, I I would like to pass on the baton to our next speaker, Alexander uh, Morrison. Thank you. Oh well, thank you for inviting me to speak at the seminar at the at this webinar. Like John, I, I haven't had the good fortune to meet Dr. Ibadoglu. Um, I've been learning about his work over the last few weeks, um, and I can see that this is very much my loss. Um, I condemn his um, detention in the most, um, in the strongest possible terms. Um, he's clearly an extremely distinguished scholar, and one who has been imprisoned because he has um, uh, undertaken research uh, and come to very clear conclusions, which are extremely uncomfortable. Um, for the current uh, Azerbaijani regime. And I think you're almost certainly correct um, that the reason that they decided to go after him um, in this very brutal and public um, and um, uh, this very brutal and public manner, which is clearly designed to sort of warn and to deter others, um, is because he started to point at the money, uh, money which of course had been um, stolen um, and laundered in this country. Uh, I'm proposing to repurpose it um, for um, the public good. So um, this is a very, um, I, I won't say a sad case exactly, it's a case that makes me very angry um, indeed. Um, and unfortunately, it's um, the kind of case which is not, which is all too common across many of the regimes um, of the post-Soviet space. Certainly, um, these kinds of cases do occur um, in Central Asia, which is the region that I work on most closely um, as well. Um, 
I mean, I'm speaking here not as an expert on Azerbaijan um, or, um, or the Caucasus particularly, uh, and as I've said, not because I'm personally acquainted with Dr. Ibadoglu, um, but in my capacity as the, the interim director of the Oxford Nizami Ganjavi Centre, um, which was founded with um, a large donation which originated in Azerbaijan. Um, uh, I am, I have to say, as much in the dark um, as all of you um, as to who exactly made the donation, <laughs> um, because as John has suggested, um, um, there is no legal requirement for universities to declare um, the origins um, of donations. Donors are, have the right to remain anonymous if they wish. Uh, our donor um, claimed that right, and as that's the term, that those are the terms of the original donation, they can't be overturned, so I don't actually know um, who the donor is either. Um, uh, before sort of talking directly about um, um, the sort of relationship between the center and, and, and Azerbaijan, I suppose I want to talk about um, the difficulties which um, events like um, Dr. Ibadoglu's arrest um, and more broadly the lack of academic freedom in, in Azerbaijan create for our center specifically, but I think more broadly for research on the region. Um, so there is, a, I think, an understandable desire, um, not just in Azerbaijan, but in other countries of the post-Soviet sphere, to see their part of the world, which um, has long been neglected in, in Anglophone or Western academia, become um, a serious object of, of study uh, in the way that you know, many other regions already are um, in, 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 in our universities. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that um, in and of itself. Um, Historically, um, you know, there's often been funding available for other areas that's not been available um, for these, um, and a centre like the Nizami Ganjavi Centre is designed to sort of meet that um, that necessity. The problem is, of course, um, that when the reputation of a research centre is becomes sort of closely tied to a particular regime um, in the region, um, it can potentially cause a lot of reputational damage um, of one kind or another. Um, so although, you know, this is obviously a minor consideration alongside the, the injustice of Dr. Ibadoglu's imprisonment um, and the suffering which he and his family are undergoing, um, uh, probably the single biggest challenge that we face with the Nizami Ganjavi Center is that people do associate it with the Azerbaijani regime and they know that the Azerbaijani regime um, does not respect academic freedom um, and is highly repressive in many um, regards. This, um, amongst other things, means that we have difficulty um, we have difficulty attracting um, applications for our visiting fellowships and scholarships um, from uh, Armenian scholars, which we would very much like to have. Uh, and this is a problem. I mean, our center is not for the study of Azerbaijan. Its its remit covers the whole of the South Caucasus uh, and Central Asia as well. Um, we've had plenty of scholars from Georgia. Um, we've had scholars from Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. Um, but um, um, Armenia, understandably enough, um, um, has remained sort of beyond our grasp, um, as it were. Um, and yes, I think there's a... Right. How should one how should one put it? I mean, John has talked a lot about reputation laundering. I'm actually a bit more skeptical skeptical about the scope of these donations to really cleanse the reputations of regimes at this time. Most people judge them on their actions um, towards their own population, um, I think. But certainly, if they are interested um, in improving their reputations, this sort of behaviour seriously undermines it. So, in other words, Dr. Ibadoglu's detention. Um, is not just a very repressive act, um, it's also an extremely counterproductive one, um, if this is the goal which they're, which they're after. And as I say, it actively handicaps and hobbles the work that we're trying to do in Oxford uh, to um, sustain and promote um, serious research um, on um, the history and culture and politics um, of the South Caucasus um, and of Central Asia. Um, so it represents a real stumbling block. Um, all that said, um, I mean, so these, if you like, are problems um, in primarily of, um, of perception. Um, that said, although I, I, as I say, I, I don't think that the, um, I don't think the original donation should have been anonymous. That was not my decision. It happened, happened well before I, uh, um, well, it actually actually happened before I returned um, to Oxford a few years ago. Um, the Azerbaijani regime doesn't doesn't is not able to exercise um, any um, undue influence over the activities of the center. Um, uh, the money sits in a university account. Um, it's spent in accordance with um, uh, academic the academic um, um, priorities, which are determined by the board that directs the center. Um, 
and um you know in all the time that i've been sitting on it um, i've never seen any sign um of um azerbaijani influence um, being exercised um, over what we're doing indeed some of the things that we've done have clearly made them unhappy um in baku i think they may have had an expectation that the money would that money would buy them that sort of influence um but it certainly hasn't been realized up until this point um, but I'll be happy to answer any questions on that. I, I'm conscious I don't want this to turn into a seminar about the Nizami Ganjavi Center. We are meant to be talking about Gubad Ibadoglu uh, and his plight. Um, but insofar as I can, if anybody in the audience wants, his, wants to put further questions on that point or any other, um, I'll be happy to respond. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Alexander. So since, since we are uh, on... Uh, indeed um, concerned very much and very deeply with the plight of Guba. I, I did actually have a question about the Ganjavi Center, uh, Nizami Gan Ganjavi Center, not so much about the donation, but about the the lady who sits on the, uh, I believe it's the advisory board. And, and certainly, uh, you know, when, uh, when I, I heard with great shock and horror after, you know, having nicely uh, had a nice dinner in London with Irada um, and, uh, and um, Gubad um, and, uh, you know, said goodbye to them as they were leaving uh, for the summer. Um, and then uh, just uh, some a few days later, I heard I hear this shocking news that he's arrested. The first th thought that comes to mind is how can we help? And then I, I learn about this um, the center at Oxford and that there is actually a family member of the Ali family on the advisory board. And the first thought that comes to mind is is the center doing something to use that kind of, uh, you know, uh, or rely on that advisory board member, if, if correct me if I'm wrong, I think that she, the, the, the this person is there associated with the center in some capacity. So is the center actually um, asking her, that person to, to help and intervene in some way, because she might have some influence with the Aliyev um, Pashai family. And so, uh, I suppose that would be my, uh, the, the question that I would have. That is indeed very relevant to the immediate plight of of Gubad uh, before, and then we can open up for the audience. If you want to quickly address whether how those that channel has been used, whether it has been used. Well, I mean, I can't I can't comment publicly on on sort of messages that might have passed between us and, and Dr. Pashaeva because those you know were um private communications we are we are going to put this item on the agenda for our board meeting um later this term where she will be present and we will be able to debate it um amongst ourselves um i mean in general the center for understandable reasons i think given the the volatile politics of the region has tended to try to focus purely on its academic remit you know so for instance we did not we have not been sending out tweets um about the um the you know the ghastly situation in Karabakh, um, for instance, um, because you know we'd be bound to um, alienate one side or the or the other. Um, but this is, of course, an academic issue, uh, so I think it is something that we're going to need to discuss. Um, however, um, Professor Pashaiva sits on the board in her capacity as a senior academic um, is in Azerbaijan. Um, if you like. Uh, the understanding is that you know her political connections are not brought into the boardroom and of course that operates in the reverse direction as well so i'm not sure um, how much it's likely to achieve unfortunately um but um we're certainly going to raise it thank you so let me open up for uh questions um so if somebody wants to raise their hand virtually please do so and I will uh, take some questions. We also have some questions, some members, some participants from Gubad's family. So by all means, please feel free to ask any questions that you might have to our of our speakers. Okay, uh, so there we have a question from Hans Goodbroad to everyone. What are the way? What are ways of escalating the pressure on the regime in Baku? 
So if we could, uh, maybe we could take each question one by one. So if somebody wants to um, answer that question um, about exerting pressure. I'm happy to come in just based on experience of a somewhat comparable previous campaign. Um, I think there is a kind of moral high ground point where academic associations can come in and say, this person is a scholar. He had political activities as well, but he's first and foremost a quality scholar and part of our community. And we sign up to a statement calling for his release. Um, I think the mechanism there isn't direct necessarily to the regime in Azerbaijan, but to the government's where universities such as this one sit to say it is not acceptable to pursue wider cooperation with a regime that does this and so the experience we had in the past was press articles of that kind statements of that kind were feeding through to governments who were saying to Azerbaijan as a state you're making it difficult for us to work with you and some of the things that you'd like to do in our country are going to be more difficult so this is where scholarly associations and particularly major academic investments by individuals who we presume are linked in some way to the ruling elites in Azerbaijan is so important, I think, um, and can send a message. And I think probably where, you know, where I'd push back a little on Alexander's statements is that line between academia and politics just doesn't work in a context like Azerbaijan, as we know, it certainly doesn't work in the Central Asian states we're familiar with. So um, without placing any question marks against the academic credentials of Professor Pashayeva, she isn't just there as a national figure there because of her academic credentials. And so there are mechanisms, I think, practically where we can use influence. And I think also on the point about reputation laundering, that you know the, the the Azeri regime has invested so much in this that clearly for them reputation matters you know they weren't trying to bribe council of europe members to change geopolitics they were doing so in order to generate a new image or reputation about azerbaijan so you know for me there is a mechanism here to to say to the regime through intermediaries you are putting your objectives as a state or as a regime at risk from your activities. That's as probably what I, as much as I would say on that. Thank you, John. Uh, did the... Shall I just come in? Sorry. Yes, in. please, no, yes. I mean, I mean, a couple of points. I think obviously um, it's been unfortunate for Gubad that, that his arrest coincide with this huge escalation of the Karabakh issue and so a lot of phone calls were being put into um the foreign foreign minister and the president of azerbaijan um from quite high level officials and clearly they were they were mainly about about karabakh about trying urging restraint not not that the restraint happened and, and trying to de-escalate that situation so that's unfortunate now um now i think uh you know unfortunately karabakh is gone um, there are obviously issues with, with what happens next with Armenia, but I, hopefully his name can be raised in those high-level conversations. I know, talking to diplomats who, who are dealing with Azerbaijan, they're, they're aware of the case. Um, Britain is obviously, uh, and the US, the two, the two places where uh, Gubad has, has been a visiting fellow in, in various universities, are aware of the case and, and can raise it now um, with, with, with Baku. That's one point. The second point is that there was in 2013, 2014, there was a big wave of arrests of, of, of people in Azerbaijan, uh, scholars, journalists, human rights activists, uh, lawyers. There's about 10 or 12 prominent people arrested. Eventually, all of those people were released, and they were released because the attention did not let up. Their, their names were mentioned repeatedly. They were, um, you know, the, the regime may have hoped that these um, cases would would be forgotten. They were not. So it was it was about patience. It was about endurance and stamina and and, and keeping up uh, the pressure. Um, and you know those people are are all uh, I'm glad to say um, out of jail. So it it it's you know, I I don't have any 
hopes that this will have a quick resolution, but I, but I think um, it eventually, I think pressure can work. Thank you very much. This is very heartening to hear. We do have uh, a question from Amin. Amin, do you want to, Amin Bayramli, I see your hand up. Do you want to uh, unmute yourself? Um, yes, uh, I apologize for the outside noise. And, uh, uh, first of all, I do want to thank, I'm the youngest son of Gulbadi Badolu. I do want to thank her, uh, the oldest speakers uh, for coming in. Uh, I had a question to Alexander, uh, uh, Professor Alexander. I had a question about the stand that uh, you have just made. I, I wanted to know, is it the stand that is coming from the Ganja Center or is it a stand that you personally, you, you personally are making? Again, sorry about the background noise. So for the moment, it's me personally. Um, and that's because in order for it to come from the center, I have to get it through the board. Um, and the board only meets once a term. Um, and the meeting hasn't happened yet. Um, so for now, I mean, I am the director of the center, but I'm speaking in a in a personal capacity. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, I, I I think the center is going to have to sort of discuss this um, because it's um, it, it clearly has a it's going to have a well, uh, quite apart from the moral issue, which is a very powerful one. Um, it's um, having a serious impact upon our our credibility and our ability to do what we're meant to be doing. Um, and that's that is certainly the case I'm going to be making to the other members of the board. Um, but for the moment, I'm speaking in a personal capacity. Thank you. We have a question from Ibad Bayramov, who is another of uh, Gubad's sons. By the way, I have to say I'm very, very impressed with uh, the the kind of very dedicated campaign that Gubad's three children have been organizing and really um, despite the kind of enormous tragedy of this situation they have been really brave and very um, very courageous um, showing really moral courage and dealing with this so the question is from Ibad Bayramov I would like to ask about the relationship between the U K government and the Azerbaijani governments. The amount of money laundering cases of Azerbaijan government and their affiliates in the UK, London is quite significant, while the amount that has been confiscated so far is quite low. Take into account the UK government. Sorry, I'm having trouble um, reading the whole uh, message, but I think that it's, um, it's quite clear. So the question is about the um, the money laundering, especially in the UK, and the kind of the perhaps paltry efforts of the UK government to kind of really deal with this problem and tackle with this. So, John, did you want to uh, address this question? Yeah, I can come in on this one. I mean, I think the first thing to say is that UK government action has been extremely limited with regard to any nationality until very, very recently. And there, with respect to Russians, we've really seen action primarily in the area of sanctions, which is obviously driven by geopolitics and the war in Ukraine. I mean, there have been these cases, to a couple of which I mentioned, of uh, the, the Fizia of money laundering case where the NCA acted and has recovered some money. The um, Azu and Leila Aliyeva's um, property transactions, which were held up. And also the unexplained wealth order case, or that that was against someone who had fallen out of favour, so not a member of, of the regime, uh, Zamir Haji, of his husband, who was in prison in Azerbaijan at the time. Um, so what we see is a generally piecemeal approach, and, and this, this is just commonplace across all areas of kleptocratic influencing. I could go on at length about why that is, why the British state so ineffective, why private sector, legal and financial services in Britain are so effective at pushing back. Uh, but this is in essence the problem. And the, the only tool that we see real, any serious action taking place upon is, is this, this very blunt instrument of sanctions. And that came with respect to Russians, you know, 20 or 30 years after hosting that money. So, I mean, I think, you know, we've had, one economic crime bill go through Parliament last year. There's another one going through at the moment. That will make the environment a little bit more difficult. There's more transparency on things like the property. So for activists and researchers, there's there's more that you can do now to find out about this money. But I think it's it's really going to be civil society 
and whistleblowers in the private sector that are going to be key at exposing this because the state has shown itself to be largely ineffective at enforcing its own laws. It's a very sad conclusion, but it would certainly be the conclusion I draw based on the research we've done. Let me also add to this that um, uh, if you remember the um, uh, the 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 flyer for this event uh, on it, you see Gubad um, uh, next doing a PowerPoint presentation with images of buildings just off Holborn here, and that was actually something I didn't know about, and certainly we learned from the Panama Papers. But Gubad was really talking to, and he's spoken to dozens of my students, so he made sure that everybody is now aware of this. You know, everybody who is you know many people who are at LSE will now. And I keep telling everybody, um, uh, you know, reminding people that those buildings one sees, and they're actually mostly empty, whole blocks of buildings. Just if you step out of Holborn off Sicilian Avenue, they belong to the Alia family. And it was all in the Panama Papers. And certainly the UK government is aware of this. And, and yet we see such um, lack of effort to address this. And as I tell my students here, you know, this is one reason why academics and students have been completely priced out of central London, out of living anywhere, anywhere close to where we study or work, because, you know, of this kind of global laundromat that L London has become, especially when it comes to high end properties in um, central parts of London. Let me see if there are other questions. Um, please do feel free. We have a few more minutes remaining. Please feel free to raise your hands or post questions in the um, in the chat. We don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, if I am not seeing hands, maybe I'm missing something. So please. Do unmute yourself and feel free to. Given that no one's saying anything, maybe I'll just come back in on the general issue that it might be worth pushing for, which is in some countries, civil society has the right to pursue money laundering cases and asset recovery cases where they can establish a link to a kleptocratic source of wealth. And it's also possible to incentivize some of these incredibly capable law firms that hide the money for members of the Azari elite to go after it. You know, they know where it's gone because they put it there uh, bluntly. And if you can switch the kind of incentive structure to mean that they can actually do for profit asset recovery, that might seem really unpleasant to us here listening to that. But that is the way the private sector works. Then you can actually have the potential value in going after some of this money. And we've seen some cases like that in continental Europe. Britain could change the law to allow that to happen. There's been some attempts to push for that in Parliament, but hasn't so far got very far. But that's the kind of change we need. So, you know, in a sense, and this would obviously not make Gulbad any more popular with the regime and Baku, but it's precisely the kind of thing I think he was sort of pushing towards when he's talking about repurposing uh, recovered assets for a social purpose and where we've seen asset recovery it often is that kind of thing where there's an attempt to put it into a scholarship fund or some social purpose um, so I think there's there is a broader role for civil society here and it seems like the kind of thing that Gubad himself would probably support. Can I just uh, maybe uh, sh we have a, a few more minutes and since I'm not seeing any questions, just just ask uh, some perha uh, perhaps something not for five minutes, but hopefully we'll have uh, um, a short answer to this rather big question about possible sort of geopolitics of oil and energy dependencies. I remember Gubad sitting with me in this office, you know, when and the war uh, rushes uh, full on assault on Ukraine. And he was telling me, oh, Ursula, Ursula von der Leyen, you know, meeting with Azeri officials, negotiating this alternative supplies of oil. And we were kind of scratching our heads and saying, you know, on the one hand, 
uh, you know, it's it's good that uh, EU is diversifying away from from Russia uh, dependency on Russian oil and gas. But then, on the other hand, it's kind of empowering these other dictators in in the region. So I wonder if maybe Thomas or uh, John, whether you want to kind of give us some comments about where you see this these dependencies disincentivizing also UK officials from doing something meaningful when it comes to laundering money. Sure. Let, let me let me jump in. Thanks, Tom. I, I think um, I've written this uh, a few weeks ago. I think it is time for a kind of strategic, always for a strategic reset, whatever you like to call it, for understandable reasons. While Azerbaijan was still um, uh, a lot of Azerbaijani territory was still under Armenian occupation, there was still sympathy. There was a feeling of you know, equidistance between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, it, on on in you know many policy decisions, but now that Azerbaijan has recovered its territorial integrity by force, um, and we're also um, and also we we see the hand of Russia in in the recent operation in Karabakh, the hand of both Russia and Turkey. I think it, it's a good time to have a kind of strategic audit about what is the value of the relationship with with Azerbaijan. You know, the, the, there are volumes of gas going to certain. I would say three or four. European countries, Italy, Greece, Bulgaria, uh, which have been useful, um, undoubtedly over the last, um, you know, and will be for the next couple of winters. But we, but this is, you know, rather limited in scope. And also the UK, I think, has a rather default, by default, a good relationship with Azerbaijan due to infrastructure projects, which are now quite old and of declining strategic importance, particularly the BTC pipeline. We do see Russia, both Russia and Iran heavily involved in Azerbaijani infrastructure projects. Uh, I mentioned at the very beginning, we, we're now seeing Sokar and Lukoil contributing to, um, you know, investing in a re refinery in Turkey. All this is about the fact that Azerbaijan is leveraging its location as a kind of bridge between Russia and Turkey at the moment, um, in enabling Russia to kind of circumvent um, all the economic restrictions it now faces uh, in, in Europe. And, and I think that is what we need, um, uh, needs to be part of the kind of strategic audit on Azerbaijan, the idea that Azerbaijan is a kind of ally in, uh, you know, Western relations against Russia, I think needs needs rethink. Azerbaijan is very, very much playing all sides, it's playing with Russia, it's playing with Iran, it's playing with the West, um, and needs to be, you know, held to extremely high scrutiny uh, when we deal with it. Thank you very much, Thomas. I think we've come to the end of our uh, webinar. Thank you uh, for uh, the contributions. And I would like to encourage uh, the participants who have been listening on and tuning in Please uh, circulate the information about this webinar. Or webinar, there will be a recording, and please continue writing to your MPs. Continue trying to raise the kind of publicize the issue of, of Gubad, and uh, hopefully, uh, and we've heard some quite heartening, encouraging. Uh, reports about other prisoners being released when the campaign is sustained and when we, we do not forget about these prisoners and these awful repressive regimes. Um, thank you very much. And um, uh, I'm sure we'll be having further conversations about uh, this. Thank you. Thanks, Tamila. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.